Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sally Rubenstein, and I am the staff librarian in charge of adult programming here at the Newburyport Public Library. Uh, we are thrilled to be hosting best-selling author and historian Kate Clifford Larson for this talk in honor of the friendship between William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Tubman. The Newburyport Public Library is presenting this talk in conjunction with Patrick, Patricia Pecknick, Vice Chair of the City's Historical Commission, with the sponsorship of the Newburyport Daily News. The presentation has been generously funded by the Next Generation Preservationists. Representation, uh, sorry, representatives of some of the organizations sponsoring this talk will be speaking briefly and then we'll begin. Please feel free to submit questions about the presentation via the chat function. Uh, Dr. Larson will be answering those at the end of the talk. If you have technical issues, please direct those to me via the chat. I would now like to introduce Maximin Clement, Clement, our representative for the Next Generation Preservationists. Thank you. So in 2018, uh, a few of my peers and I started the Next Generation Preservationists, uh, where a group of high school kids interested in the relationship between historic preservation, affordable housing, and environmental sustainability. We joined the Newburyport Preservation Trust that same year, and now we are interning with them. The reason we're funding this lecture is because we want the community to know that people my age about, care about preservation of the buildings of new houses of Newburyport. We're a 21st century generation growing up in the middle of 17th, 18th, and 19th century architecture, like the one where Garrison was born, for example, and we know how lucky we are to live in such a historic city. We have had the privilege of interning with a community organization, the Trust, where the board members volunteer hours and hours of their time researching, studying, and defending historic houses. And that's how we learn what civic engagement really means. It means that you speak up for important things that can't speak up for themselves. Seeing Tom Coulter John, Stephanie Nikitich, Linda Miller, and other members of the board fight so hard to save his houses that make the report so beautiful has been a great inspiration to the kids of my generation. It showed us that it's worthwhile to speak up on behalf of things that we believe in. For many years, I've been drawn to hip hop music that talks about a very similar topic, gentrification, and the affordable housing crisis it creates in American cities. Songs that talk about new development around this country pushes people out of their homes. And the sad truth is, this isn't just happening in music lyrics in big cities like Boston, New York. It's happening here. It happens when small houses get torn down. It happens when it seems like every single inch of grass has to be filled with more and more new houses. Will people in my age even recognize New Report in 10 years? Will we be able to afford to live here? Many of us in the next generation preservationists are graduating seniors, and we will go out and apply the values and skills that we've learned from the trust into advocating for preservation wherever we end up. Please support historic preservation and please support the trust. Tom, Stephanie, Linda, and members of the board, thank you so much for teaching us the true meaning of community. Thank you. Thank you, Maximin, and please thank the rest of the members of the next generation preservationists who worked on this project. Garrison got his start as a journalist at the New Report Herald, so it was crucial for us to have the Daily News involved in this talk. I'd like to introduce the editor of the Daily News, Richard Lodge. Thank you very much, Sally. In the preface to his 1998 book, All on Fire, about William Lloyd Garrison, author Henry Mayer called Garrison, quote, an authentic American hero who, with a biblical prophet's power and propaganda skill, forced a nation to confront the most crucial moral issue in its history, slavery. Garrison was a Newburyport native, born here in 1805. He lived his early years in a house on School Street in the shadow of the Old South Church. As a child, he worked as a printer's devil. That's a term for an apprentice in a newspaper office who had the most odious tasks, including scrubbing ink from lead printing slugs and melting down lead type to be reused for the next issue of the newspaper. There were many newspapers in Newbury Port's early years. Between 1773 and 1854, there were 35 different newspapers published here in Newbury Port, although many didn't last more than a year. After struggling through various apprenticeships, William Garrison got his start as a writer in 1818 at the Newbury Port Herald, the predecessor of the Daily News. Garrison worked at different newspaper jobs, and at age 25, he joined the abolitionist movement. By then, he was working as co-editor of an anti-slavery newspaper in Maryland. And on January 1st, 1831, Garrison published the first issue 
of his own weekly anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, in Boston. In that issue, that first issue, Garrison wrote, quote, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. He was heard very clearly as a leading journalist of the abolition and abolitionist movement for 35 years until the Civil War ended. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and Garrison published his last issue of The Liberator. By that time, Garrison had produced 1,820 issues of his anti-slavery weekly and never failed to publish a single issue. The Daily News of New Report began as an independent daily in 1887. It included the Herald, as part of its masthead until that was dropped in 1952. As editor of the Daily News, which is one of the sponsors of this lecture, I'm pleased to have author Kate Clifford Larson here tonight. I'm proud to support this effort to bring the life and work of William Lloyd Garrison, one of Newburyport's own, into the spotlight. His legacy should be part of the discussion about the important social movement that brought an end to slavery and that continues today in the quest for fairness and equality for everyone in America. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to the Daily News for sponsoring this talk and for publicizing it. Now I would like to introduce Mayor Donna Holliday. Thank you, Sally. And thank you for your uh, wonderful words, Max and Richard. Uh, this is a wonderful event tonight. I am you know, proud to be here just for a few minutes to uh, introduce our uh, renowned uh, lecturer and author tonight. Uh, Dr. Kate Clifford Larson is Brandeis University's Women's Studies Research Scholar and the author of three critically, critically acclaimed biographies, including Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero. Her biography of civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hammer will be out next year. This lecture on the friendship between William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Tubman was commissioned to honor Garrison's legacy on the 215th anniversary of his birth, December 10th, 1815. Given the connections between abolitionism and women's rights movement, I asked Dr. Larson to discuss the connections between these two movements. Thus, the focus on this unlikely friendship between Garrison and Tubman. Thank you. And without further ado, please welcome Dr. Kate Clifford Larson. Well, thank you very much, Mayor, and everybody here. Um, I am uh, so grateful um, that this inaugural event is happening and I get to talk about two of my most famous favorite people, Harriet Tubman and William Lloyd Garrison. And um, I, I wanna give a shout out and um, for, to the Historic Commission and the Preservation Trust, the Next Generation Preservationists, um, the Daily News and Richard Lodge and, and um, you know, all these people in Newburyport, the library, that are working hard to make sure that Garrison's legacy, his memory is not forgotten. And his legacy is so important, especially today. And I think, you know, Tubman now is, is fairly famous, but telling the stories of these amazing Americans today is really important because we can't let another generation go without telling their stories and having models for people to look to, to continue to um, struggle and make this world a better place. If their stories have been told from the 19th century after the Civil War forward, if there were statues of William Lloyd Garrison in city parks across the country instead of Confederate statues, then maybe the world would be a better place today and it would be different. Anyway, Nat, that's my, my political speech for right now. Um, so now to Lloyd and Moses and their remarkable friendship. And William Lloyd Garrison was known as Lloyd. He was called Lloyd by his mother and his friends and his family. Um, I mentioned to Patricia Pecknick uh, yesterday 
um, how much I was looking forward to this evening. Writing this lecture was a bomb from my soul. To be here to talk about these two American heroes um, brought me great joy during these kind of complicated days when core American values of freedom, equality, justice, and self-determination face daily challenges and threats. Today, as in yesterday, and for many eras before us, the imperfections and deficiencies in the exercise and defense of those values confront us. That's why, that th this is why what you all are doing here in Newburyport to celebrate and honor your hometown hero and remember those who stood strong in the face of a defective union that did not live up to its promises enshrined in the Declaration of Independence is so vital, vital to our democracy today. William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Ross Tubman rose up and made a difference. They fought their way up from the most uncertain of beginnings to futures as two of our nation's most important patriots. How incredibly joyful and pleased the two of them would be that we were all here today to celebrate their deep and mutually caring friendship born in the struggles for liberty. I don't know whether it was kismet or divine intervention that lit a spark between Tubman and Garrison, but their unlikely alliance in the mid 1850s, Boston helped change the world. Uh, when Garrison met Tubman during the 1850s, the Underground Railroad conductor was a fugitive from the law, an unjust law that made her a refugee from her own home down in Maryland. And everything and everything she loved was there in Maryland. Her small size, she stood five feet tall, but it disguised the brilliant warrior inside. Seemingly fearless, strong, and steadfast in her incredibly deep faith, she won over Garrison and the Boston abolitionists when she told them of her missions to liberate family and friends and wage a personal war on slavery. He called her Moses the Liberator, and the nickname stuck. From that day forward, they stood on equal ground, two passionate, like-minded people fighting for liberty, equality, and justice. They were two soldiers for freedom. But who were these two individuals? Where did they come from, and how did they find their way to each other? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. As you heard from Richard, um, uh, Garrison was born in 1805 in Newburyport, that beautiful seaside village, and at the time it was teeming with merchants who bought and sold, shipped and received goods and people from around the world. His parents, devout Baptist evangelicals, Francis Maria, as she was known, Lloyd, and Abijah Garrison had come from New Brunswick, Canada. Maria was renowned as an unofficial exhorter preacher. She led prayer meetings in a neighbor's home. She had a gift for speaking and inciting religious fervor in um, people that attended her meetings. But in 1808, Garrison Sr. abandoned the family. Maria, Lloyd, and his brother James and baby sister Elizabeth were now on their own. For years, they struggled and often went hungry and were cold. Eventually, his mother moved the family to Lynn, but life remained hard. Lloyd longed for school and received precious little of it, even when he was sent back to Newburyport briefly to live with the Bartlett's fellow Baptists in 1814. Lynn was no place to raise her family, Maria realized, so she moved her, them to Baltimore, Maryland, where she found work as a nurse for private families. Lloyd accompanied her to church every Sunday while her, his brother James became an all alcoholic and eventually disappeared. Fortunately for Lloyd, his mother sent him back to Newburyport for more education and the comforts of the Bartlett's home. At the age of 13, as Richard told you, he apprenticed at the Newburyport Herald as a printer's devil for Ephraim Allen. It changed his life forever. Literate and a quick study, Garrison had access to so much and he was able to educate himself every day and fine tune his own particular literacy and passion for words. 
He began writing the articles for the newspaper. And with those early evangelical teachings and the sermonizing from his mother, it greatly informed his prose and he made a name for himself. In the 1820s, he joined the anti-slavery movement. At first, he was attracted to the American Colonization Society founded in 1817 by prominent slaveholders, anti-slavery activists and non-slaveholders alike who sought to establish a colony in Africa to resettle free and formerly enslaved African-Americans. By 1829, however, Garrison rejected its philosophy. He was in Baltimore at that time, back in the city that he had lived with his mother briefly. By then his mother and sister had died. He became co-editor of abolitionist Benjamin Lundy's Genius of Universal Emancipation uh, newspaper, an anti-slavery newspaper. He gave, became deeply involved with the anti-slavery movement there in the city and spent most of his time in Baltimore's black community. It was there he sharpened his pen against slavery, so much so that he ended up in jail for libel against a slave trader. Once released, he came back to Massachusetts where he co-founded the Liberator, as Richard told you, with fellow abolitionist Isaac Knapp of Boston. Like in Baltimore, he found a home in Beacon Hill's African-American community. In his inaugural issue, Garrison told the world his plans I will be harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. To tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm, tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher, tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into, into which it was has fallen, but urge not me to use moderation in a case like the present. As you heard before, he said, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. This was Garrison, the immediate abolitionist, the journalist, the man and the friend of the enslaved. Within a year, he helped to establish the New England Anti-Slavery Society and the next year, the American Anti-Slavery Society, the AAS. They advocated for the immediate emancipation of all enslaved people and the end of slavery. His wife, Helen Benson, who he married in 1834, became his staunchest ally. Now in 1831, when Garrison started publishing The Liberator in Boston, Harriet, nine-year-old Harriet Tubman, then called Minty Ross, was enduring a horrific childhood as an enslaved child in Maryland. She was the fifth of nine children of enslaved parents, Harriet Rick Green Ross and Benjamin Ross. She was born in 1822 in Dorchester County on the Eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. She, they named her Araminta and called her Minty for short. Her survival was tenuous at best for most of her childhood and young adulthood. Slavery is the next thing to hell, she once said. Her father, a timber inspector who supervised and manages significant timbering interests for white uh, landowners on the Eastern shore and her mother, a domestic, struggled to keep their family safe and together. They were not always successful. Repeatedly hired out as temporary workers to local farmers by their enslaver, Edward Brodus, Tubman and her siblings suffered from heartbreaking separation, neglect, and violence. She recalled daily whippings from the age of six, resulting in scars still visible when she died in 1913. Those separations from her family exacted a heavy toll, and Tubman suffered intense loneliness, fear, and ill health. Brodus further traumatized Tubman and her family when he sold three of Tubman's sisters, Lina Soph and Mariah Ritty, permanently fracturing the Ross family. Tubman and her family probably had no idea who William Lloyd Garrison was or the battle he was waging against slavery and slaveholders through the pages of the Liberator. Threatened by anti-slavery messages in print or spoken word, slaveholders went to great lengths to prevent the open distribution of abolition literature and newspapers. 
Additionally, slaveholders generally withheld opportunities for formal education and made the possession of the tools of literacy punishable by whipping, scarring, or sale away from loved ones, like this is among enslaved people. Like most enslaved people, Tubman could not read or write letters, but she was literate. Forced to survive in a hostile environment where physical assault punctuated demands for work and obedience, she learned at an early age to anticipate danger and protect herself by reading human character, emotions, and intent. As she grew into teenagehood, she learned to read the landscapes of Eastern Shore fields, forests, marshes, rivers, and streams. She learned to read the night sky, instructed by black mariners called blackjacks, who were ubiquitous in the Chesapeake. Around 1835, a blow to Tubman's head from an iron weight thrown by an angry plantation manager at another fleeing enslaved man nearly killed her and caused debilitating headaches and epileptic seizures that plagued her for the rest of her life. If this injury caused her great suffering, it also coincided with an explosion of religious enthusiasm and visionary activity that foretold the future and gave her comforting words as if they had come directly from God. Her deep faith fortified her during her darkest hours. After a lengthy recovery, Tubman began working with her father in the forest, which opened distinct and consequential opportunities. Not confined to the domestic sphere like her mother and working in an atypical work setting, logging, Tubman's education continued through the efforts of her father and others who passed along the intricacies of communication networks of black maritime workers, stevedores, shipbuilders, landsmen, mariners, and more living and working on waterfronts near where she lived and worked. That network connected communities throughout the Chesapeake Bay, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New England. That knowledge enhanced her special and growing literacy. While Tubman labored unfree in Maryland, Garrison was building on his campaign against slavery. Based on classical Republican with an R, small r, ideology, abolitionists envisioned a society rooted in an active citizenry that placed the common good ahead of private gain. Abolitionists argued that the family was man's best hope to fight the moral delinquency inherent in the world around them. Home and family represented goodness, a place where mothers and fathers imparted moral influences on their children. For abolitionists, slavery presented a particular egregious moral, physical, and spiritual dilemma. Slavery assaulted the slave family through selling of family members away from one another. It also promoted physical and sexual assaults on enslaved women by their white enslavers, thus corrupting the white family as well. The potential depravity of the human mind and body led many women, abolitionists in particular, to argue that the unlimited power of one man over another was morally and spiritually unacceptable, that it led to sin, both physical and moral. Lloyd and his wife, Helen Benson, whom he married in 1836, 1834, imbued their children with those same values and commitments to serve the greater good. They read children's anti-slavery literature, poetry, and sang anti-slavery songs. The children learned their ABCs from the anti-slavery alphabet and read about the history of the slave trade and the abolition movement. They played anti-slavery games and reenacted Uncle Tom's Cabin and held mock, dramatic mock slave auctions in their yard. Black and white abolitionists and religious leaders were a fixture in their home in Boston. The children listened to their animated talk of destroying slavery. Freedom seekers seeking shelter came and went from their home. For Garrison and his followers, called Garrisonians, commitment to liberty and equality extended to equal rights for women. The experiences of the mid to late 1830s had taught them that free speech and slavery could not coexist for long in any society, they said, and the spirit that would cut off free speech was the spirit of slavery, end quote. Though dedicated to nonviolent forms of protest, they were often subject, subjected to violent and dangerous confrontation with angry protesters who picketed and disrupted their public meetings. Not all abolitionists believed women deserved equality either. 
Lewis Tappan was one such abolitionist. An early member of the American Colonization Society, Tappan rejected the aims and tactics of the colonization movement, just like Garrison did. Tappan and his brother Arthur, among others, joined the Garrisonians in the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. But Tappan split with Garrison over the issue of allowing women to attend and vote in the Anti-Slavery Society's conventions and meetings. In 1840, when Abby Kelly was elected to serve as an officer in the organization, Tappan quit. According to his strict religious beliefs, he opposed the participation of women in any official capacity, particularly in a public society. He and other anti-Garrisonians, as they became known as, established the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, which competed directly with the AAS for a unifying vision of abolition. But Garrison was committed to equality for women, for Blacks, for everyone, and he would not be deterred. He embraced other progressive movements too. His pen and voice grew stronger and louder. In 1844, at the annual meeting of the AAS, Garrison stood up to open the proceedings. And instead of inviting a minister to pray, as was the usual practice, he read Psalm 94, shocking the audience with his passionate condemnation. Quote, the Lord is a God who avenges, O God who avenges, shine forth. Rise up, judge of the earth. Pay back to the proud what they deserve. Oh, how long, Lord, will the wicked, how long will the wicked, wicked be jubilant? And he went on and on to say, they pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the foreigner. They murder the fatherless. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? The wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my fortress and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. He will repay them for their sins and destroy them for their wickedness. Oh, the Lord our God will destroy them. Those are words that Tubman would have been standing up cheering loudly about. But that same year, 1844, 22-year-old Minty Ross married a free local black man by the name of John Tubman. She shed her childhood name Minty in favor of Harriet after her mother. But her life was thrown into turmoil when her enslaver Edward Brodus died in 1849. His estate was deeply in debt and the Ross siblings faced certain sale. Tubman determined it was freedom in the North or death. She escaped and arrived in Philadelphia in the late fall of 1849. She settled into safe anonymity in the largest free black community in the country at the time. She met Garrison Ally and a founding mo mother of the women's rights movement, Lucretia Coffin Mott, later telling a friend that Mott was the first white person to help her in that city. Tubman also met William Still, one of the most famous Underground Railroad agents of all time. It would be through these individuals and their colleagues that Tubman would tap into one of the greatest Underground Railroad networks to freedom in the country. She needed those contacts because freedom felt empty without her loved ones. She was determined to bring them to freedom too. She found work as a domestic, saved her money so that she could finance her escape plans. Traveling by night using the North Star and instructions from black and white helpers who were part of a well-organized underground network, Tubman began her decade-long mission of liberation. Using her keen intelligence and deep faith combined with unwavering determination and remarkable endurance skills and all those literacies, she navigated some of the most dangerous terrain in the world. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 left most refugee slaves vulnerable to recapture, so many fled to the safety and protection of Canada. Indeed, Tubman brought many of her charges to St. Catharines, Ontario, where they settled into a growing community of freedom seekers. She defied detection by those who might re-enslave her. She carried a revolver and often varied her route. Some paths to freedom were by water, others overland, 
but all were dangerous with slave catchers and snitches lying in wait to betray her at every turn. Tubman tapped into that vast and well-organized network to freedom that operated from the Chesapeake to Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Over a 10-year period, that network enabled Tubman to rescue about 70 family and friends and give instructions to about 70 more who found their way to freedom independently. Word of Tubman's work and her remarkable success rescuing her family and friends spread throughout anti-slavery communities in the North. She had many contacts in New York City during the 1850s, the anti American Anti-Slavery Society's offices on Nassau Street served as an underground railroad depot. Sidney Gay and Oliver Johnson, garrison colleagues, um, were officers in the society and editors of the National Anti-Slavery Standard, another anti-slavery newspaper in the country. As allies of Garrison, Tubman trusted them. She sought their help ferrying freedom seekers from Maryland to safety in Canada and other parts of the Northeast. The men found Tubman remarkable. Gay called her Captain Harriet Tubman. Another ally in the city included Garrison's rival, Louis Tappan. In spite of how much Tubman loved Garrison, she was also pragmatic. Last week, Tappan wrote to a friend, a black woman from Canada applied to me for assistance. She is 35 years of age, is a fugitive, has been back to slave states twice since living in Canada to bring out friends and relatives, and was on her way once more to bring out of bondage two or three with whom she knew, but who were relations and who were relations of a friend of hers who asked her to conduct this errand of mercy. Tappan asked her what would be her feeling if she should be caught and sent to the far south into perpetual slavery. She replied, he later wrote calmly and resolutely, I should have the consolation to know that I had done some good to my people. Garrison's Boston community was no different in their admiration and support for Tubman. It seemed inevitable that she would find her way there. She found freedom, dignity, and a welcome from the Garrison family. Wherever she went, she was showered with tremendous respect and awe for her bravery, tenacity, and uncanny ability to elude capture. The garrisons and other powerful women and men of the day were deeply moved by her. She was also in need of their help. Her rescue missions were costly. Sometimes they cost the, as much as $100 per mission. And she needed that money for recently rescued family members as well living in Canada. Boarding in a house on the north side of Beacon Hill during the mid 1850s um, and at, at, in Boston's African American community where uh, William Lloyd Garrison had been welcomed very early in, in the 1830s. Tubman hosted personal meetings. Garrison provided access not only to the highest echelons of abolitionist society and their money in Boston, but to the inner circles of Boston's powerful women's suffrage community as well. Garrison's son, Willie, met Tubman sometime around 1858. He recalled an evening when Massachusetts Governor John Andrew, abolitionist Wendell Phillips, his father Lloyd, and other abolitionists had gathered at Samuel May's home in Boston. Quote, I shall never forget, he wrote, the exquisite manner of Mr. Phillips, when asking the attention of company, he introduced to them in a few words of deep feeling and admiration, the little black woman of black complexion and African stamp. Had she been a duchess, no courier could have surpassed that genuinely deferential presentation. Nor can a more striking contrast have been furnished than that between the flower of Massachusetts culture and the product of the slave whip and plantation. That night they stood on equal ground." End quote. That was the night the garrison called her Moses the Liberator. Frederick Douglass, who had long admired Garrison and credited him with launching his abolitionist career and inspired him to start his own newspaper, had broken with him because of his past of his views. In, but, in, but Douglass, still remained a, an ally at a distance. Douglas introduced militant abolitionist John Brown to Tubman in the spring of 1858. 
He later wrote that he had never known anyone other than John Brown, who, quote, willingly encountered more perils and hardships to serve our enslaved people than Tubman. Brown found a, found a kindred spirit and quickly recognized her great intelligence. Quote, he is the most of a man, end quote, Brown wrote that he had ever met with. Blurring the gender conventions of the town, time, um, Brown recognized her great, great intelligence and her great courage. Only um, men exhibited that kind of courage in his world, in that world. Only men were generals. He called her General Tubman. Brown was a radical like Garrison, but he championed armed conflict over Garrison's pen and voice to, slave, to slay slaveholders. Brown spoke Tubman's language. Tubman loved Garrison, but she disagreed with his pacifist views. Brown claimed that he heard God's voice too, and that voice directed him to destroy slavery and slaveholders. His evangelical fervor was not out of step with the worldview of many enslaved people. His vision resounding in ap 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 apocalyptic and judgment day metaphors seemed to answer Tubman's prayers. Brown believed it was time for God's wrath to descend and that through him, um, swift justice would be served to unrepentant slaveholders. Slavery was murder, he believed. Though Tubman failed to join Brown's raid in October 1859, as she promised, perhaps she knew it was doomed, um, he did, she did under, recognize that his death would spark a civil war. Back in Boston, Tubman spoke at the New England Colored Citizens Convention held at Tremont Temple, Temple in August of 1859. Still at risk of capture and rendered back to Maryland and re-enslaved, Tubman was introduced to the audience as Harriet Garrison to protect her identity as a fugitive refugee. Quote, Miss Harriet Garrison was introduced as one of the most successful conductors on the Underground Railroad Garrison Star reporter James Yarrington wrote. She denounced the colonization movement and told the story of a man who sowed onions and garlic on his land to increase his dairy production. So till he soon found the butter was strong, it would not sell. And so he concluded to sow clover instead. But he soon found the wind had blown the onions and garlic all over his field. Just so, Tubman said, the people had got them here to do their drudgery, and now they're trying to root them out and send them back to Africa. But, she told the audience, they can't do it. We're rooted here. They can't pull us up. She was much applauded. The garrisons Tubman found were not only actively working to dismantle the slaveocracy, but involved in all those progressive movements that she would be attracted to, women's rights, religious liberty, education reform, support for immigration, prison reform, and they hid freedom seekers in her, their home. She, found, she had found a virtual and spiritual family. Throughout the summer of 1860, she continued to visit and speak at small anti-slavery meetings, intimate parlor gatherings, and larger public venues. On July 4th of that year, she attended a woman's suffrage meeting with Helen Garrison at Melodian Hall in Boston. The Liberator reported, quote, a colored woman by the name of Moses, who herself a fugitive, has eight times returned to the slave states for the purpose of re rescuing others from bondage, and who has met with extraordinary success in her efforts, including the rescue of her aged parents from Maryland, won much applause. Southerners took notice of what the Liberator reported. Even though it enraged them, they read it. John Bell Robinson, a pro-slavery writer in Philadelphia, read that article from the Liberator with horror. With great indignation, he told his readers that, quote, a female conductor on the Underground Railroad had been feted by Boston's women suffragists, which he derided as well. This woman, Moses, enjoyed so much praise for bringing her parents, quote, away from the ease and comfortable homes where they had been caressed and better taken care of around the plentiful board of their master. 
He argued further that Tubman's cruelty to her parents was a thousand times worse than to sell young ones away. I can't believe somebody wrote that, but they did. I don't think Tubman would have agreed and neither did any enslaved person. Tubman's personal war on slavery eventually led her to Port Royal, South Carolina, where she alternated her roles as nurse and scout, cook and spy in the service of the Union Army. In June, 1863, she became the first African-American woman ever to lead, uh, lead an armed raid. After collecting confidential information from enslaved people on rice plantations in Confederate controlled areas to the west of Hilton Head, Tubman guided Colonel James Montgomery, another radical abolitionist and the commander of the second South Carolina colored volunteers up the Comby River in early June. With the help of eight male scouts who worked for her, they sailed around um, explosives, that, explosives that had been planted in the river they routed out rebel forces, looted and burned numerous plantation homes and liberated more than 750 people. The quote, black she Moses is what they called her. She worked with several union officers who welcomed her into their offices, listened to her advice and gave her what she needed. Shortly after that raid, Francis Jackson Miriam, a radical abolitionist who joined John Brown at Harper's Ferry but successfully escaped capture, observed the admiration and deference Union officers displayed toward her. Quote, I have seen this Major General David Hunter, uh, Jackson wrote in a letter to Governor John Andrew, go and fetch a pitch of water and stand waiting with it in his hands while a black woman drank as if he had been one of his own servants. That woman was Harriet Tubman, end quote. The following month, Tubman witnessed the carnage inflicted upon the all black Massachusetts 54th Regiment in July of 1863 at Fort Wagner. After that battle and throughout the war, she provided life-saving nursing care to black soldiers and newly liberated people who crowded union camps. In February of 1864, George Garrison, um, Lloyd and Helen's son, then commander of the Massachusetts 55th stationed on Foley Island in Charleston Harbor ran into Tubman. A group of abolitionists had arrived from Boston in Hilton Head eager to work for, with the newly liberated freedmen. They asked George to find Harriet Tubman for them. They were eager to see this black she Moses. Quote, when we entered where she was at work ironing some clothes, George wrote in a letter to his brother Willie, Mrs. Severance went to introduce me by saying, here is George Garrison. And she no longer saw me, then she recognized me at once and instantly threw her arms around me and gave me quite an affectionate embrace, much to the amusement of those with me. We had a very interesting conversation with her. He goes on to talk about how she wanted to go north, but says that the generals will not let her go. They think her services are too valuable to lose. She's made a lot of some money cooking and cleaning, but she, her business is to get information for contrabands escaping from the rebels. She was credited with getting more information from those contrabands than anyone else was able to. She had the misfortune, he wrote, of having $50 stolen from her. What money she had, uh, Mrs. Severance took for her to send North to Boston and George made sure that she had more money coming her way. The health and security of her parents and her other family members in Auburn was a constant source of worry for Tubman. She saved everything she earned to send to them. The army at that time did not pay her for her services as a spy and intelligence officer. They only paid men, black and white men for those services. Her abolitionist friends, like those who visited her on Foley Island and George, of course, were frustrated by the army's attitude and they remained ready to lend her a hand in the stead of the army. Tubman earned a furlough and headed home to see her parents, stopping along the way in New York City in the summer of 1864, while Wendell Garrison, George's brother, greeted her. Quote, Moses Garrison, he wrote to Willie, alias Harriet, alias General Tubman has arrived. Oh, what times, he wrote excitedly. 
She spent part of the summer in Auburn, New York with her family where she had purchased a home in 1859 from William Henry Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State. By August, she was back in Boston making rounds of visits with abolitionist friends and raising money to support her family and for the needs of freedmen in South Carolina. That September, Willie Garrison married Martha Coffin Wright's daughter, Ellen. Martha Coffin Wright was the sister of Lucretia Mott and Mott was the one that directed Tubman to move to Auburn where she would be safe and where her family would be safe during the Civil War. Uh, Tubman knew Ellen and loved her. And when Ellen married Willie Garrison, it cemented another relationship for Tubman. A few months later, Wendell Garrison married Lucy McKim, the daughter of Underground Railroad agent and Tubman ally, James Miller McKim of Philadelphia. Tubman's family was growing. After the war, Tubman returned to Auburn, New York. She was reluctant to accept charity, although she readily took money when offered to her. Boston friends sent her funds to help provide for her house full of dependents. She had many freedom seekers that had fled and moved to Canada and they followed her to Auburn and her large family moved into her home there as well. That money that the garrisons and other Boston abolitionists sent was enough money that kept them warm for the winter. The garrisons continued to send her fu funds for decades. That first year Tubman could not work through the winter because she had been beaten by a railroad conductor who threw her off a train in New York City. That increased the financial and physical burdens already weighing on her. She later told Willie Garrison when he visited in April of 1866 that her family would have suffered for food that past winter because she was disabled. They had to burn their fences for firewood. He gave her $10 that his father had set aside for her. He promised to pressure the railroad company whose conductor had brutally beaten her and vowed to try to get recompense for her pain and suffering. Tubman told Martha Wright that the money that he gave her could not have come at a better time for she wanted to get some potatoes to plant and she was afraid Mr. Garrison misunderstood her and thought they were suffering for food, which she said it was not true. They had too many kind friends, she told Martha Wright. But Martha told Willie and her daughter, Ellen, that Tubman has a good deal of that honest pride, end quote, which makes her unwilling to beg. Ellen Garrison remembered Tubman giving her advice on how to soothe a colicky baby. Willie always made the effort to see her when he was in Auburn visiting his in-laws. The children quoted Tubman's Bible verses and prayers often in their letters and worried about her health and financial status as long as they lived. She loved them deeply too. Quote, Harriet Tubman came on Wednesday to see you and the baby, Ellen's mother, Martha Wright, wrote from Auburn in 1867. She didn't hear of your call till the evening before and was so disappointed that her eyes filled with tears. She never shed a tear in telling me of all her troubles. I comforted her with Willie's donation and she seemed grateful and sent her love to all of you and her inquiring friends. She said she would see you yet. I wish I had thought to send for her while you were here. The deaths of Lloyd and Helen in the 1870s were a blow to Tubman. She could not be there to take care of Helen all those low years she lived as an invalid after a stroke during the Civil War and Lloyd had removed himself from the daily world of activism after 1865, and she sh he shuttered the Liberator newspaper. But Tubman still had their children to love and fuss over. Over the years of writing lever letters back and forth to Auburn, Ellen and her mother and others kept everyone up to date on Tubman's activities. In one letter that Ellen wrote to her husband from Auburn while she was visiting, she wrote, Harriet Tubman has been to see me quite often with little offerings, some lovely fresh eggs and a remedy for the throat. I think she takes me for a real garrison. Tubman struggled financially for the rest of her life, however, because she gave everything she earned away, sheltering, feeding, and providing for those less fortunate. 
She also channeled her post-war activism to challenging the inferior political, economic, and social status of women and African Americans. The struggle for gender and racial equality became central to her identity for the remainder of her life. She challenged her friends and foes alike to confront the inhumanity, degradation, brutality of a system that denied people of African de descent their full rights of citizenship. If one person in the community remains shackled, the whole community remains bound and chained, she said. She had suffered enough for the vote. I can't imagine how frustrated and disappointed she was when Congress passed the 15th Amendment to the Constitution giving Black men the right to vote, but not women. By the 1880s, Tubman's fame as an Underground Railroad agent and Civil War hero had faded significantly. Hold on one second here, sorry. Um, she had not been a constant fixture at suffrage or black civil rights conventions and meeting around New, New England throughout the 1870s and early 1880s. A newer and younger group of activists were often seen at those conventions, many of them middle-class and highly literate in distinct contrast to Tubman. In addition, many of the old abolitionist guard had passed away, including Clusia Mott, Thomas Garrett, Wendell Phillips, uh, the Garrisons, Lewis Hayden on Beacon Hill, and Martha Coffin Wright there in Auburn, leaving Tubman with a shrinking support system. A few new friends were, friends were ready to step in and help though. And Tub, uh, Ellen Garrison's sister, Eliza Wright Osborne, and all of the Garrison children buoyed Tubman when she needed it the most. In April of 1897, the Women's Journal, a white suffrage movement's official newspaper, reported several receptions in Tubman's honor in Boston, sponsored by former white abolitionists and current suffragists. The 75-year-old was feted at the offices of Willie Garrison, who was offering the latest edition of her biography for sale. She visited with the Garrison children and grandchildren, among others, and spoke at the Old South Meeting House on Washington Street, along with other aging former anti-slavery warriors later that summer. She refused to accept the limitations restricting the lives of women. She continued to attend suffrage meetings until the early 1900s, traveling to Boston repeatedly, Rochester, New York, Washington, DC. She confronted the racism endemic to the suffrage movement. Her friend Susan B. Anthony stood by her side, but other suffragists would not, forcing black women to fight for suffrage on their own. Tubman had known the biracial cooperation, the devotion and the caring that had worked to end slavery, and she expected the same in pursuit of equal rights. The Auburn Citizen newspaper reported that Tubman upon her deathbed in 1913, asked Mary Talbert, president of the New York State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, to tell every woman that the women should stand together. She died at the age of 91 on March 10th, 1913, without being able to vote. A groundswell of grassroots support over the last 20 to 30 years has catapulted Tubman to greater fame than the day she died in 1913. It took many, many years, but we now have her historic home in New York, two national parks, a Maryland State Park, a multi-state byway in her honor. She's inspired city parks and museums, numerous statues, books, cartoons, movies and plays, jazz, blues and rock and roll music, dance production and opera. She inspires children and adults everywhere. We, and we remain hopeful she'll be on the $20 bill. But why is this important and what does this tell us? First of all, it tells us that we need to do the same for William Lloyd Garrison. We need to know the stories of heroes like Garrison who to inspire Americans today and people around the world to stand up. He inspired thousands, millions of abolitionists. He inspired Harriet Tubman. He welcomed her, supported her, sheltered her, and gave her sustenance. Their legacy, Tubman and Garrison, can inspire the greatness in all of us and make the world a better place. His memory, Garrison's memory, his story, his legacy needs to spread across this country. This day, this time, it, it, we need it. 
People marching in the street can be inspired by William Gar Lloyd Garrison, who stood up, who was beaten by crowds, who was attacked, who was threatened, who had a bounty on his head. From that evening that he and Tubman met, they stood on equal ground, two passionate, like-minded people fighting for liberty, equality, and justice. He fought with the pen. She fought with her strength and her passion and the power of her own special literacies. His respect and admiration for her carried her through many dark days. He was an amazing ally. She demanded that he work harder, harder to destroy slavery, and her passion fortified his ferocious attacks on the slaveocracy. Civil rights activist John Lewis, one of America's most beloved congressmen, now deceased, was a direct participant in protest and rebe rebellion like Tubman. He reminds me that Tubman and Garrison's legacies live on in voting rights and registration campaigns, anti-racism and Black Lives Matter marches, the Me Too movement, anti-poverty activism, equal pay and the battle for civil rights and social justice. They were two American patriots, two allies in the battle for America's soul. John Lewis once said of the legacy of Harriet Tubman, but I think this can be said about the legacy of William Lloyd Garrison. The legacy of these two people, quote, in America and around the globe today is one of being willing not to be afraid, to be of good courage, to be willing to go into places where few others dare to go, being willing to stand up, to speak up, to speak out and find a way to get in the way. Let's do that, like Garrison and Tubman. Thank you, New Report, for honoring this incredible friendship. Freedom fighters, civil rights icons, international heroes and symbols for liberty, equality, justice, and self-determination. Let's get Garrison a national park or two or three, and let's start marching in memory of the two of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming, Kate. Uh, looks like we have some uh, questions, at least one question in the chat. Um, can you see that one? I can. Uh, let's see. Many in New Report rightly admire Garrison's abolitionist activism. However, Ibram Kendi's 2016 book, Stamp from the Beginning, paints a complex picture of Garrison beyond his well-known radical call for the immediate emancipation of slaves. Garrison felt the conditions of slavery rather than biology made blacks inferior to whites, believing that education and opportunity would lift blacks out of the state of inferiority. But Kendi sees this view as contributing to racist discourse in the 19th century that, rather than contributing to anti-racism. This is because it positions blacks below whites, a view that racists also held. Do we need to give more attention to Kendi's view and perhaps more critical of Garrison's achievements? So, you know, I, I, I agree with um, the commentator's uh, question and presentation of that. So in this lecture, I, I did not attend to Garrison's fail failings and he hit the, the product of his upbringing in the environment that he lived in. Um, for instance, he, he, vow he told people not to vote. I mean, that's ridiculous. How can you not vote? You need to vote to make change. Um, and his views about education were rooted in his own past in literacy and learning to be literate and using the pen to fight this horrific behemoth called slavery. So in his worldview, that was the only thing that he could see that elevated people. Um, but the way he presents it in his, in, in his text, it does in our 21st century view seem very racist and assumes that white people are superior. But I know the way he looked at Tubman and believed in her and was inspired by her. She did not have the same literacy that he had. And I know that that affected him. So I, I think it, it, it's worth exposing what um, 
Kendi talks about in his work, at the same time recognizing that yes, people are very complicated and complex and their views come from different places and they play out differently um, in the ways that we might not always find attractive. But, you know, I believe that in spite of, of Garrison's failings, and he had quite a few, um, if we had been raised in telling those stories of his courage in standing up to racist and uh, mobs in Boston and other cities, in having his life threatened, and he still carried on, he still fought to end slavery, and he inspired Tubman, he supported her, and she, she admired people who were willing to give their lives for the cause. And that's important, and we need to celebrate that. If we learn those, those stories about the garrisons of the world, starting after the Civil War, right through uh, to the 21st century, I really believe that our national narrative would be very different. The lost cause myth would not have the power that it had throughout um, the 20th century and now is rising again out of the ashes. So yes, we need to talk about the complexities of Garrison. At the same time, we need to, to recognize the power of people like Tubman who didn't have literacies to affect change and to affect the views of people like Garrison. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, feel free to type them into the chat. Okay, we have someone raising their hand. Um, I think we have a few enough people doing that to ask questions verbally. Sure. Okay. Jack, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, well, um... Not sure if this is a question. I, I just want to say I wish you were here five or six years ago to give this talk because that's when the uh, Daily News, long before Richard Lodge became editor, uh, ran a front page report that claimed that local historians uh, had selected Caleb Cushing as the city's most significant historical figure. Uh, he was the first mayor of Newburyport. I believe he was governor of Massachusetts. He was mm -hmm. on the state Supreme Court. He was also a Southern sympathizer. Right. And um, I don't know if I could turn this into a question. It's uh, the case that you make at the end is that we should all uh, get behind him. Uh, I'm not sure that the city itself is behind him. Well, I think this inaugural lecture might be a start. This the program that you all have put together, and now you you are pushing forward with this to celebrate Garrison. You know, I think there are only two statues in the country to Garrison. Maybe there's one more. I'm not really sure, but you know, I think it's a discussion you should have with the community and say this man changed the world. His pen was so mighty, so mighty and he brought people into the movement and he would not stop. He, just like he vowed when he published that first issue, he was not going to give in until slavery ended. A lot of people disagreed with his tactics, but he was brilliant and he moved us to the civil war, which ended slavery. And I, you know, I think he definitely is the most famous person from Newburyport. And he is a famous American hero, and he should be treated that way. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, but just to go one step further, I took it uh, five or six years ago as uh, uh, that selection as uh, a repudiation of William Lloyd Garrison, given what Caleb Cushing stood for at right. the time. So. So um, what would Lloyd do? He would take that repudiation and he would take his pen and he would slay it. <laughs> I, you know, I think that that's, you have your marching orders. Well, I'm glad that you do that. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to do it myself. That's all I have to say, thank you. There you go. 
Okay, there are a few other questions. Um, one about further reading, um, questions about how to get young people excited about um, the $20 bill, I think would be a good start on that one. But, um, <laughs> right. Thoughts on these? So I think, um, you know, I think that children are so open to hearing their, these stories when they're very young. And um, I think children's books about William Lloyd Garrison would be fabulous. Is there a children's book author out there? I don't know if there are any children's books, but you know, there are probably 150 children's books about Harriet Tubman. I think we could use a few about William Lloyd Garrison. I think that, um, you know, his, their, what they did is something that we recognize in people today. There are garrisons and Tubmans in our communities today. They're out there, they're working hard and they need our support. So if we can't be the Tubmans and the garrisons, then maybe we can fundraise for them. We can find them in our community and support them and elevate them and recognize their genius and their talents. Maybe there are students in the high school. I'm looking at your young preservationists, and that is stunning to me that that there are young people that are interested in history and saving the the fabric of our story, and um, and that's a great place to start. I would start modeling that around the country. I think it's just brilliant, and I think um, you know children love inspiring stories. They do. They like to feel that they're empowered. And the stories of, of Tubman and Garrison can empower children. They wouldn't, th those two people would not stop. They are heroes, they're heroes. And so I think engaging young people in those stories and telling them that, you know, there are people that have come before them and stood up strong and young people today and, and grownups and old people like us can do the same. Uh, and there's one question about, um, do you know if uh, Garrison ever met with Abraham Lincoln? I don't know that. I'm, I, so I'm not, a, an, a, I don't know all the details of Garrison's life. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure there's a Garrison expert on this webinar that probably knows. Um, I know Tubman did not meet uh, Lincoln. She didn't want to. She felt that he betrayed African-Americans because he did not agree initially to um, have black soldiers in the Civil War. And then she changed her mind afterwards. She realized that she had made a mistake. So um, are there any other questions directed towards Kate? They're talking here on, on the chat about signage. And I think, you know, that is a great way to start getting the story out. Signage and, um, uh, you know, walking tours. I'm, I don't know if you have a walking tour in, in Newburyport that talks about Garrison's life and how the roots of his personality come out of that town and his opportunities for literacy and education his mother's uh, religious fervor, how it all comes together to create this unique human being who changed the world. Okay. I mean, if there are no other questions, oh, there's, a, there's an answer for us. Oh, Frank Garrison. Thank you, Frank. This is a Garrison descendant. Um, and, and Frank says here that Lloyd did meet with Lincoln and Lincoln acknowledged him for his work. Um, and that's great. I would have, yeah. It's uh, good information for the next lecture. Learn something. I apologize. No it's, no, it's good. I thought the lecture was wonderful. Um, I am reluctant to end the meeting when there's so much activity going on in the chat. I know. Yeah. So um, there's a comment here about um, Tubman joined um, the networks of Underground Railroad or Underground Railroad networks. Um, there, he <clears throat> was wondering how many networks there were. They were everywhere, all over the country. And um, there were many in the South 
um, that are still, we don't know a lot about them because they were very, very much hidden. But in the North, there were networks that, that emanated out of Philadelphia, New York City, uh, Boston, throughout New England. And uh, there were many, many, many different networks. So, uh, but Tubman happened to tap into one of the most powerful ones that included the garrisons and Boston and New York City and central New York to Canada. Um, but I don't want you to think there was one Underground Railroad and it preceded her by, you know, decades. And um, she was just one person in it, although she was probably one of a handful of conductors and she was the most prolific conductor. Okay, so um, I don't see any other questions. I just wanna say thank you for coming, Kate. And uh, thank you so much to Patricia Pecknick for involving the library in this talk and roping us in because uh, it's been a really wonderful thing to be a part of um, bringing this lecture to the community and also uh, just getting to um, kind of collaborate with so many other entities in the city. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that again in the future. And uh, if anyone has anything else to say, this is the time to say it. Thank you so much, Sally, and everyone at the library for this. And Kate, thank you so much. This was very inspirational. And thank we're you. just honored that you were here. Well, thank you. And I, I admire all your work and I, I just encourage you to keep it up because seriously, Garrison deserves a park. He does. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. I'm going to end the lecture now. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Thank you.